Good afternoon everybody and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present part of the research I do in collaboration with Dr. Gilberto Teobaldi at the Ada Lovelace Center of the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the United Kingdom. The computational tool I will present to you today relies on electrochemical experiments using a technique that is called electrochemical quartz crystal microbalance, EQCM, as schematically shown in this picture. We have a quartz crystal in grey, which is sandwiched in between two metal electrodes in orange. Here we have the side and the top view of the top and bottom electrodes. The quartz crystal is exposed to an oscillating electrical field in between these two electrodes that can induce resonant vibrations within the crystal. The top electrode becomes the working electrode that is in contact with the electrolyte and connected to a counter electrode via a potential stat. By changing the applied voltage, one can trigger chemical reactions at the surface of the electrode. The kind of information that we can extract from this device are the current that passes through the working electrode for charging and discharging, and also because the amount of material at the surface of the electrode will change, this will be manifested in changes of the resonant frequency of the quartz crystal as a function of the voltage. Today I will present to you a new software that we name as ALC EQCM that is capable of handling the experimental data and obtaining stoichiometric information for the chemical reaction. In addition, it is capable of building atomistic models that are compliant with these stoichiometric changes together with files that allows the computational simulations of the generated structures in high performance computing facilities. So how can we use EQCM experiments to investigate complex chemical reactions? Unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into details, but if you follow standard protocols and use technical specifications of the EQCM device, it is possible to correlate the changes of the coarse crystal resonance frequency with the mass variations associated with the chemical reaction. In addition, from the current and the information of how the voltage was changed with time, it is possible to integrate the profiles and obtain the total charge associated with the process. These results here correspond to the intercalation of potassium in nickel oxyhydroxide hydrated, which is the example I will use in this talk. This material, nickel oxyhydroxide hydrated, is schematically shown in this picture. We have layers of nickel, oxygen and hydrogen separated by distances larger than 8 Armstrong. The intercalated water here in orange is very important for this material because it provides structural stability. You can think the water behaves as a glue. These yellow tags will be used throughout the talk to emphasize results and statements that I would like the audience to remember. Experimental evidence showed that if the water is missing or it is not enough, the system undergoes the phase transformation from the alpha to the beta phase that contains no water and the separation distance reduces to 4.6 Armstrongs. From the intercalation of a species point of view, this phase is preferred and exhibits much better performances than this phase. In fact, the size of this phase makes it difficult for these species to, to intercalate. Therefore, for this kind of materials, efforts are focused in trying to preserve the structural stability during the intercalation to prevent this phase transformation. When it comes to writing a reaction formula for the intercalation, we consider the species that participate in the reaction, each one with the different stoichiometric coefficient. As a result, we have the stoichiometric formula for the material with the intercalated potassium plus an extra term that accounts for the charge balance. From the knowledge of the amount of moles of the prepared material before chemical reaction, N, and using the masses of the involved species and the Faraday constant, it is possible to write the equation for mass and charge conservation, where delta M and delta Q are obtained from the experiments. So here we have two equations and three unknowns. Therefore, we have an infinite number of solutions, where two stoichiometric coefficients will depend on the third one. So the question that arises is, which is the energetically favorable solutions amongst this infinite set? And the strategy that we will follow is that we are going to consider selected solutions in this infinite set. We're going to build atomistic models and use density functional theory to perform simulations. 
So now we report the computed solutions. In this graph, we show the amount of potassium and water as a function of the amount of protons in the material. We cannot have any possible solutions. The constraint is that the stoichiometric values for each one of the involved species must be either zero or positive. Based on this constraint, the valid set of solutions span from uh, a content of protons that goes to from 0.03 to 0.68. So the solid lines represent the infinite number of solutions that we discussed about, whereas the dots are the finite set of solutions that we consider. So let's analyze some solutions amongst this, uh, this set. This solution, for example, has got a very, very little amount of potassium, 0.68 protons, and 1.37 water molecules. The reaction that leads to this stoichiometry is shown here, and when we analyze the amount of water and potassium involved, and we take the ratio, we find 95. This means that the intercalation of every potassium happens also with the intercalation of 95 water molecules. So this solution, even though it is a possible solution of the charge and mass balance equation, seems to be a bit unrealistic. So let's consider a different solution, this one for example. In this case we have 0.5 protons, 0.185 potassium, and one water. So you see that the content of water has not changed. So this solution for the stoichiometry happened at the intercalation of potassium, but there was no water involved. And this solution, on the other extreme, has very little protons, the maximum amount of potassium, 0.68, but we have no water left. Again, when we consider the water and the potassium that participated in the reaction, and we take the ratio, we find minus 1.45. So this means that 100 intercalated potassium removed 145 water molecules. So what we learn is that different solutions correspond to different physics. So far we have only discussed about mathematical solutions. When it comes to building atomistic models, we can do it manually, but this is complex and tedious, you don't want to do it. And for this reason we have developed this software that generates atomistic models automatically for you. So you have to provide an input structure, in this case nickel oxide hydroxide hydrated, and the algorithm will change the content of potassium, hydrogen, and water such that it will match the stoichiometries that you requested. In addition, you can generate files that will allow the simulation of the generated structures using different codes. The formats available are BASP, CP2K, Castep, Quantep, and very soon Quantum Espresso and Siesta. Even though we have focused this particular example, the implemented algorithm is quite general and valid for any reaction that can take place in an EQCM device. After having generated the atomistic structures and performed DFT simulations, we are ready to address this question, which is the energetically favorite solution following intercalation. Before doing so, we realize that we compare structures that contain different number of species, so we need to work with the formation energy. In addition, we're going to use this parameter x divided by y that, as we have shown before, corresponds to the amount of water in comparison to the amount of cations that participate in the reaction. Results are shown here. We obtain that the lowest formation energy per formula unit happens when the value of x divided by y is equal to minus 1.45. And if you remember, this corresponds to this solution that contains no water following intercalation. So, this result suggests that the intercalation of potassium removes completely the water from the sample. But if you remember, water is very important for this material because it helps to provide a structural stability. You can also think about the reverse process when you want to deintercalate the potassium. In this process, there will be regions of the materials that would be empty before water and protons can be reinserted back. Therefore, the material will lose structural stability and will be prone to undergo 
this alpha to beta transition that we discussed before. So we learned that the potassium induced dehydration is responsible for the deterioration and poor battery performance. We have repeated the exercise, this time by performing experiments using a solution that contain lithium, contains lithium instead of potassium, and the results are completely different. We find that the lowest formation energy per formula unit is found when the value of x divided by y is zero. This means that there is no water that participates in the reaction. You see? No water. In other words, the intercalation of lithium does not change the water content within the material. And this result is in agreement with the evidence that the material responds much better to battery cycling when you use lithium in comparison to when you use potassium. So what we learn is that the material responds differently depending on the intercalated species. Finally, we summarize the talk with the following sentences. EQCM provides information of charge and mass variations during an electrochemical reaction, but no stoichiometric resolution. When we combine a reaction formula with EQCM data, for the general case of three or more species involved, we obtain an infinite number of solutions, all of them valid in principle. ALC EQCM selects a finite number of solutions among the infinite set and generates atomistic models automatically. This strategy is very convenient because it constrains the search of stoichiometric compositions to solutions compatible only with EQCM experiments. Computational simulations of the generated structures allows for fundamental research of electrochemical degradation, intercalation, and reactivity. With this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.